Welcome to Let the Quran Speak. Hadith are an important source of Islamic rulings and in Islamic law. They tell us and they give us details about how to pray, how to eat, and really everything in between. So what are Hadith and what sort of role should they have in Muslims' lives? I'm here with Dr. Shabir Ali to begin a new series called A Balanced Approach to Hadith. Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. Pleasure to be on. So Dr. Shabir, we've done this series before, but we have a lot of new information that we want to bring out to, uh, in this new series. Um, so maybe you can begin, Dr. Shabir, by telling us what are hadith. Yes, while we want to bring out some new information, we also have to set the basis. Yes. Uh, and that means uh, also, you know, giving some outlines of things which might already be known to many people, but uh, some people may need to get this refresher. So basically, a hadith is a report about something the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, something he did, something that was done in his presence, uh, to which he did not object. So Muslims collected this sort of information, using them as precedents for Islamic law. Now, this is in addition to and separate from the Quran itself. Uh, the Quran, we believe to be a revelation given to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, by God, uh, somehow inspired into his mind by the angel Gabriel, and he just recited that uh, to the public. So apart from that, what about other things he said? You mentioned uh, something as mundane as eating. Uh, when he was at the dinner table, uh, what, what did he say? And uh, um, what did he say well, you know, when he went to the marketplace or you know, something of this nature? Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we, we need to know um, the differentiation between the Quran on the one hand, the Hadith on the other hand, and uh, how problems occurred in the Hadith uh, as distinct from the Quran. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us briefly what are what are some of the problems that arose? Yeah, so uh, the, the, there arose the phenomenon of hadith forgery, uh, and uh, what it, this means that as people were citing things that that they remembered from the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, he said this, he did that. Um, it's almost like our Christian friends asking, you know, what would Jesus do in a certain situation? So Muslims would quote, "What did the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him do in a certain situation?" But people sometimes misremembered. Sometimes people invented things. And uh, sometimes they wanted to, you know, come up with something sensational. Um, and, and, and so forgeries entered into the picture. People forged sayings about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, circulated those, and uh, they were well, well received sometimes by the masses. And so the scholars had to kick back at this and say, well, wait a minute, let's uh, study this and, and sift between uh, what is genuinely from the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, and what might have been forged by, by other people. And so they uh, put together massive collections of hadith, which in their minds uh, were good uh, or even authentic sayings of the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, as distinct from the other uh, material which was floating about in that sea of uh, um, you know, narratives, some forged, some genuine. Mm -hmm. So when did the sifting process occur, Dr. Shabir, and how good was it? Um, and, and, you know, we have hadith collections now. Are they now seen as authentic? Yeah, so we have some major collections. Two of them are thought to be uh, the most authentic of the, of the rest. Uh, Sahil Bukhari, the mo absolute most authentic, and then Muslim uh, fo following closely. And then we have another four, which are deemed to be part of what is called the Seha Sitta, the uh, the six authentic books, uh, including uh, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, uh, An Nasai, and Ibn Majah. There are other collections as well, uh, but these uh, are, you know, the, the, these hold the pride of place as being recognized as authentic, basically authentic books or authoritative ones. Um, and they're used widely. Now, the, the problem for us is that these books also contain narratives which are uh, problematic from a modern uh, point of view. And uh, while we won't bend and change our religion to, to, to please people, we, we have to follow what God uh, said and what his prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, instructed us as, as part of the revelation that he received from God. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we should uh, look at these narratives that are causing problems for people. Uh, apostasy is not a simple thing. And uh, we, we note that uh, many Muslims uh, have apostatized largely because of hadith. Hmm. And uh, some of them put out YouTube videos explaining why they apostatized, and they're mentioning some of these hadiths. So we need to take that seriously. Is this really causing such a problem for Muslims that despite everything we say and do, uh, Muslims are apost apostatizing from the faith? We also notice that uh, many who want to attack the Islamic faith, they pounce upon the hadiths. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, that uh, creates problems in the minds of young people in particular, especially on YouTube and on the internet more generally. Uh, and in, in my dialogues with people of other faiths, sometimes we have an antagonistic person who insists on uh, you know, certain hadiths mm-hmm. and uh, insists that I should accept those, uh, those narratives. Um, and I try to present a balanced approach, saying that on the one hand, uh, yes, we use hadiths uh, for our prayers and details of our performance of hajj and giving charity and fasting and so on. Uh, so we use hadiths where it is benign, where, where the hadiths are benign. But uh, uh, where the hadiths are problematic, uh, we are not constrained by our faith to accept those, those narratives. Now, that position basically is the position of the masses among Muslims. Mm-hmm. Most Muslim Muslims uh, who are following Islam trying to take it seriously, praying and fasting and so on. Uh, this is their nature. They pray according to the hadith, but if they find a hadith that is problematic, like let's say, for example, a hadith that says that Aisha was married when she was nine years old. So most people know that uh, nine years old, a girl at that age is not so mature to uh, be married off. Uh, and so they would put that aside. It would not. It would not matter to the average Muslim. But it, it is uh, a, a conundrum for for people who are trying to get to the bottom of things. Like some for some people, it doesn't really matter. I'm praying. I'm fasting. You know, I'm doing everything that Islam requires of me. Why bother with these other narratives that don't make sense? But for the youth who are trying to make sense of everything, they want to make sure. Like if. If there are some hadiths that do not make sense, then what do we say about the whole? Mm-hmm. Uh, they they might want to apply a principle. The Quran says, uh, uh, Have they not pondered the Quran? If it had been from any other than God, they would have found there in much discrepancy. So uh, when uh, youth with this mindset are there championing the Quran, look, the Quran is free of all discrepancy, and this that is because it is from God, right? And if it, if, if it, if it had any discrepancies, then it wouldn't be from God. Well, then, on the other hand, uh, scholars are there on the, on the uh, mimbars, on, on the Muslim uh, pulpits, um, and, and telling the public, oh, but the hadith is also a sort of revelation from God, and they might cite even hadiths. To justify that claim that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Utitul Qur'ana wa mislahu ma'hu, I've been given the Qur'an and something like it other than it, mm-hmm. which, which is a justification opening the door here for hadith. But and Dr. So, Beer, you know, scholars generally understand that you can't take everything from the hadith, right? You need to either contextualize it or use it for different purposes. And, and the, they know that the books contain um, some things that could be problematic if quoted out of, out of context, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So they know that. But what they do then is, uh, on the one hand, they will selectively uh, present hadiths uh, which uh, do not contain problems generally. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, and so the, the public gets the impression that every hadith we have ever heard is a good one. So hadiths must, on, in general, yeah, be good. Uh-huh. Uh, second, if they are presenting hadiths which are problematic, they will do so for the pro- purpose of defense. And then they will mention some, you know, principles by which we approach these hadiths, you know, let's be sincere about it. Let's uh, assu- assume that this is uh, from God through the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So it must be right. And let's imagine a scenario in which this is right. So they, they are, they're using cushions in order to make the hadith palatable. But uh, so someone in the middle of a sermon might be saying, yeah, that sounds okay. But then they go talk to their colleagues and they try to present this, these reasonings to other people and other people don't have that faith basis to start with and they're starting from a kind of a skeptical angle and they're saying, well, wait a minute, this doesn't really make sense. And then it comes back to the Muslim and the Muslim says, well, yeah, I can see why it wouldn't make sense to a non-Muslim. And then uh, thinking about uh, it a little bit more, the Muslim realizes, wait a minute, it doesn't even make sense to me though I'm a Muslim. Mm. Uh, so uh, th- th- that's when people apostatize. Mm-hmm. So, uh, or so that's when, what. What solution would you propose? I know, I know, it's a it, it's a problem, a yes. difficult problem. What 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 is the way forward? So, in the series, we will look at some problematic hadiths, and we will propose that uh, the the what scholars are already discussing. They're saying we need to go back to look at the text of hadiths. So far, hadiths has been largely criticized from the point of view 
of the chain of narrators. And we accepted the hadith because we know that a good person related it from a good person, from another good person. But now we have to look at the content itself and ask, is this the kind of thing that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, likely said? Or is this the kind of thing that somebody likely invented? Um, you know, it's not like a barcode scanner that will get a clear answer. We have to use some human judgment here. But often we'll find that these problematic hadiths are uh, the kinds of things that people would have invented at the time and not the kinds of things that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said. I'm excited for this series, Dr. Shabir. Me too. Let's do it. Tired of seeing how Muslims are depicted in media? You can help. Support Muslim Media Hub, the first of its kind to empower young Muslims to create content for film, TV, and social media. Visit our website, QuranSpeaks.com, and donate.